Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Walburn. I'm a partner here at Seacrest Wardle, and my topic for today is third-party contractors. So we'll start off with what a third-party contractor exactly is. And as you can see from the slide, a third-party contractor is an entity um, that has entered into a verbal or written contract with a premises owner to perform particular services. Uh, some common third-party contractors uh, in the premises liability context include some of the uh, contractors that I have listed for you, landscapers, snow removal companies, irrigation companies, and roofing contractors. But they also include other entities like gutter installers or awning companies, uh, cleaning crews or parking lot resurface companies. The, the common uh, contractor that you're going to see in these type of cases are generally going to be snow removal companies. We have a lot of cases out of the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court involving uh, a, a third party contractor snow removal companies duty to, uh, to, act, to uh, perform its obligations under the contract, uh, removing snow, um, laying down salt uh, for the ice, uh, and things of that nature. So, as I'm sure you know, in a negligence case, we generally have four elements that have to be proven by the plaintiff, duty, breach, causation, and damages. Um, in a, in a, uh, uh, a threshold question in a negligence action, therefore, is whether the defendant owed a duty to the plaintiff. And that's kind of where we go with the third party contractor uh, situation. Um, the duty in a premises liability case arises out of either a statutory duty, a contractual duty, or a common law duty. Uh, in the third party contractor case, it's usually going to be a contractual duty. Um, there's going to be a contract between the snow removal company and the premises owner uh, to remove the snow, to lay down the salt, whatever the case may be. So what is the duty of a third-party contractor? Well, we have some case law that helps us out in this regard. But historically, um, with every contract, there was a common law duty to perform uh, with ordinary care the thing agreed to be done. And a negligent performance constituted a tort as well as a breach of contract. So we have some significant developments in the case law. Now, in this first case, which I have listed on the slide here for you, Durbabian versus Mariner's Point Associates, uh, the defendant was a snow removal contractor, and he had uh, the court held that he had no common law duty to plow, inspect, or salt the parking lot where the plaintiff was injured. The Court of Appeals held that the defendant did not breach a duty of care um, when it failed to inspect the parking lot on the day in question. The plaintiff did not have an independent tort action against the third party contract uh, contractor. Excuse me. So there was a, uh, dis a distinguishing uh, element between nonfeasance and misfeasance by the uh, by the court of appeals. Now nonfeasance is kind of the the failure to perform the contractual duties, whereas misfeasance is more of the um, you know, performance of the contractual duty in an actively negligent fashion or, you know, actively causing a hazard or a danger. So based upon Derbabian, no tort claim arises solely from the defendant's failure to perform its contractual obligations. Um, next, we have the Fultz decision, which is, which is a notable case. It's an important case. Again, the defendant was a snow removal contractor. The plaintiff had slipped and fallen. Uh, on an icy parking lot, which the defendant allegedly failed to plow or, or salt. Uh, the Michigan Supreme Court rejected the misfeasance and nonfeasance analysis as too slippery. Um, so the, uh, the court looked at misfeasance as a separate and distinct um, element from the contractual obligation. So the court said that in Fultz, there was nonfeasance as opposed to misfeasance. So the court did not provide a detailed analysis of its separate and distinct approach. Uh, as the plaintiff's claim against the defendant was for the failure to perform its contractual duty of plowing or salting the parking lot, the claim failed under the separate and distinct analysis. 
the plaintiff's cause of action against the third party contractor was therefore dismissed. And as you can see on the slide here, misfeasance may be a separate cause of action, separate and distinct from the contractual obligation. The Supreme Court reiterated that no tort claim arises solely from the failure to perform the contractual duty. Now, the Fultz progeny indicates that uh, there is um, that there is some conflict with Fultz. Now, I mention in the slide uh, Banizak and Merzueski. Mer <laughs> um, both of these were rejected in a later case called Loki, which we'll get to in a moment. But I, I, this case, the Banizak case, further interpreted a third party contractor's duty. It, it was later rejected by the court, um, but uh, in Banizak, the Otis elevator uh, company was contracted to con construct the elevators, escalators, and moving walkways throughout the Detroit ter uh, airport terminal. They were required to cover a wellway or an opening at the end of the moving walkway that uh, has the mechanical elements within it. The purpose of the cover, obviously, was to protect people using that area. Plaintiff was injured when she stepped on an inadequate piece of plywood covering the wellway. So according to the Michigan Supreme Court, the hazard was the subject of the Otis contract. So Otis owed no duty to the plaintiff that was separate and distinct from its duties under the contract. So even though the defendant clearly increased the danger to the plaintiff or otherwise committed a misfeasance, the court uh, held that there was no distinction between the misfeasance and the nonfeasance. So the, um, the, uh, there was no breach of a duty separate and distinct from its contract. This is in sharp contrast to the false progeny. Similarly, uh, the Merjewski case, which I also cited on uh, the slide that you can see, was also later rejected by the Supreme Court in Loki. Here, the defendant committed a misfeasance by uh, piling the, the plowed snow onto a landscaped curved island in the parking lot. Uh, the, the argument went that this created a new and unreasonably dangerous hazard because of the melting and the refe refreezing that occurred in and around those areas. So there was some concern about some ice in the area. Again, the Supreme Court rejected the plaintiff's argument that the defendant owed the plaintiff a duty separate and distinct from the contract, even though, similar to the Banizak case, there was a misfeasance um, you know, the active creating a, a more hazardous situation as opposed to a non-feasance. So we come next to the Loki decision, which is the current state of the law. So in Loki, as mentioned above, Loki rejected the Banizet case, the Mirajewski case, and other post faults decisions um, that uh, kind of curtailed or tried to do away with almost the separate and distinct duty regarding misfeasance. Loki arose out of an accident which occurred at a construction site where the plaintiff was working for an electrical subcontractor. The defendant's employee left a bunch of cement board um, boards stacked against a hallway wall, which then fell on the plaintiff and injured his leg. Um, the Supreme Court rejected the Court of Appeals um, holdings and indicated that Fultz did not distinguish the simple idea that is embedded deep within the American common law of torts. If one having assumed to act does so negligently, then liability exists as to that third party for failure of the defendant to exercise care and skill in the performance itself. So Fultz didn't extinguish that common law duty like the duty to use ordinary care to prevent physical harm to foreseeable persons or property. Rather, in looking at to the contract uh, first in the cases, the court in Loki clarified that under Fultz, the proper initial inquiry is, aside from the contract, whether the defendant owed an independent legal duty to the plaintiff. Therefore, a contracting party's assumption of contractual obligations does not extinguish or limit separately existing common law or statutory tort duties owed to a non-contracting third party in the performance of its contract. So essentially, 
the Supreme Court brought Fultz back to its primary holding of the difference between a nonfeasance and a misfeasance and when a, um, in, uh, a person who is not a party to the contract can then sue for a breach of a duty for misfeasance. So then that takes us to the Hill versus Sears case in 2012. Again, a Michigan Supreme Court case. This one addressed the issue of whether an appliance installer from Sears um, had a duty separate from their contract to install appliances. So uh, the, the uh, washer and dryer getting um, uh, installed in this person's house by the Sears appliance people. Apparently there was an exposed uncapped gas line within the uh, appliance area right there. So the Supreme Court took a look at this and said, due to their limited relationship, the installers did not have a duty to take any action um, with respect to that exposed uncapped gas line. They also did not have a duty to warn the homeowners about that uncapped gas line. Um, the, the installers did not create a new hazard by placing the dryer in front of the uncapped gas line, <clears throat> excuse me. So again, kind of going back to the non-feasance versus misfeasance uh, analysis from Fultz. Bailey is uh, kind of an odd case. Um, this is the last case in determining whether a duty exists for a third, of a third party contractor. This is a 2013 case and I included it because the court remanded this case back to the Court of Appeals to determine the security company's duties pursuant to Loki's clarification of faults with the non-feasance versus misfeasance in a separate and distinct duty. Um, the Michigan Supreme Court um, uh, examined the issue of whether the third party contractor called high tech, which was the security personnel hired to patrol the premises was under a duty to the plaintiff based upon the contract to provide uh, security services. Um, for the premises owner. Apparently the plaintiff was shot and paralyzed during an outdoor event at the premises uh, common area. Now the Supreme Court focused his attention more on the landlord management company's duties to uh, the plaintiff to notify the police if given notice of a criminal situation on the premises. Um, you know, the Court of Appeals um, had stated that the facts alleged involving the contract between high tech and the landlord would impute to the landlord the notice of the criminal situation. So the landlord had the duty to inform the police. You know, that's, that's kind of a, a, a side uh, issue um, with respect to the contract between the landlord and high tech. Um, again, as stated um, earlier, that the Supreme Court remanded this case back to the Court of Appeals to, con to uh, have a consideration of the non-feasance versus misfeasance analysis under the original interpretation of Fultz um, and Loki to uh, decide whether there is a duty um, on the part of high tech here. We'll be uh, watching this case closely and we'll uh, give an update uh, when we have one. So the moral of the story here. Well, uh, according to Loki, courts presented with a false defense should begin their inquiry with an analysis of whether the defendant owed the plaintiff any legal duty that would support a cause of action in tort, and whether that be a common law duty or uh, any sort of uh, contractual duty. I know there's some issues with a third party beneficiary of a contract, which Loki doesn't really speak to that. Neither does uh, Fultz really a lot speak to that as well. Um, but we'll be watching that closely as that case law develops. Um, by referring to the broad common law duty to use ordinary care to prevent uh, physical harm to foreseeable persons, Loki kind of opens that door for virtually any injured party to argue that they were owed an independent common law duty or, of, uh, of ordinary care. Um, so as I stated here in my slide, essentially if a third party contractor performs an act, it must do so reasonably. So this is in large part returning to the former standard governing the misfeasance versus the nonfeasance. So a third party contractor's failure to act despite the contractual duty to do so, will not establish liability. However, unreasonable actions, regardless of the contractual language, may impose liability on a third party contractor. Um, so increasing the danger uh, due to its negligence or 
creating a new hazard due to its negligence may impose the liability on the third party contractor. Now lastly, I had a quick little discussion in here, and you can see it in my, um, in my uh, seminar materials and on the slide here as to the open and obvious defense uh, with respect to third party contractors. Those of you who practice or who work in the premises liability area know this open and obvious defense from Lugo. Um, in order to, it, usually it's used in um, the slip and fall, trip and fall type situations. Now, can the open and obvious defense apply to a third party contractor? And the short answer is probably not. And I listed the case here, Gafari versus Turner Construction Company. The Supreme Court held that the open and obvious doctrine did not apply as it is specifically applicable to a premises possessor. Uh, in Gafari, the plaintiff was a subcontractor working at a construction site. So this wasn't a normal uh, situation where we have a slip and fall um, and you know, on ice um, or on an um, unlevel sidewalk, uh, which are, those two are usually the most common situations, or in a grocery store slipping on something, a wet floor or some food that had fallen. Those are the usually the times that you're going to see the open and obvious defense. This involved a subcontractor working at a construction site, and he tripped on some pipes on the ground and sued the construction manager as well as two subcontractors. Um, the Michigan Court of Appeals applied the open and obvious defense, dismissing all the plaintiff's claims. Great for us. We were super excited about it. Uh, the Michigan Court of Appeals held there is nothing in the history of the open and obvious danger doctrine to suggest the doctrine should not apply in other contexts. So in context outside of the premises liability, um, slip and fall, trip and fall type situations. So the defense bar was pretty excited about this. We can go ahead and use the open and obvious defense in more construction type situations, which when we were starting to see some more cases involving those. Then the Michigan Supreme Court uh, granted leave to appeal and reversed the Court of Appeals and held that the open and obvious doctrine did not apply. Um, according to the Supreme Court, the open and obvious doctrine is specifically applicable to a premises possessor. So the open and obvious defense probably is not going to apply in construction cases unless we get a change of the law by the Supreme Court here, which is likely not to happen. Um, so the so in closing here, the open and obvious defense will probably not apply to most third party contractors, but you know there's always a chance. So this concludes my uh, presentation on third party contractors. I appreciate everybody's attention, and um, if you have any questions, I'm in the Grand Rapids office. My telephone number uh, is six one six two eight five zero one four three. My direct is 616-272-7973. And you also see my email address there as well, swalburn at seacrestwardle.com. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, please feel free to give me a call or email me at any time. Thanks.